Okay, so we have finally gotten to the point where I think we have a strong enough handle on how to implement and import things in JavaScript that we can introduce the concept of React in a way that uh, you'll understand exactly what's happening with all the uh, source code examples. Uh, and in fact, you'll see, I think what you'll see in these React lectures is that the way we started to design and implement our front end views for the last couple of client side labs. So namely the quiz lab is going to be very reminiscent of what it's like to use React. But React does essentially all of the work of organizing your front end views and components uh, as opposed to you having to manage that like we did in the quiz lab. So with, with, with that said, let me jump over to my slides here. Stretch this out some. Perfect. Okay. And we will, oh, this is certainly not right. That's, I don't know. That's probably more right. Okay. So, React, the last of the, uh, the letters inside of the MERN stack, which is what we've been learning. So, as you might recall, those letters, if we were to translate them, um, and so it's from this initialism, it would be a uh, M for Mongo, E for Express, R for React, and N for Node. So this is really the last letter of the things that we have to cover to say you understand what a MERN web stack is. Now, by all means, you can develop web applications without React. In fact, many of your web applications will likely not use React since I punt at React as the very last concept that we'd really be, major concept that we really would be covering. And so that was on purpose because I knew that you could do front ends proficiently in just JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. And so all the more mission critical concepts you needed, I can ensure that we cover first. Uh, so, so just to pre-answer questions, you are not required to use React on your full stack application. However, if you're capable, I would encourage you to use React because if you were to use your project inside of a um, your full stack application for a job interview perspective, it's nice to highlight that you know how to use React. But there will be a lab, so you will be able to highlight that you do have a competency in React via uh, the lab that will be companioned with this lecture. Okay, so a quick overview of today's lecture. We'll just simply talk about, well, what prereqs are typically required before one starts using React. Uh, what is React? We'll look at React versus the event-driven model, which is what we've been using to develop our front-end uh, uh, user interfaces. Then we'll actually take a look at using React and take a look at some React examples. We'll talk a little bit about what JSX is, what components are, what properties are, and then what we're essentially returning from uh, React uh, component function. And then uh, we'll follow up this uh, lecture with a couple more lectures, likely on React hooks and even React component objects. So there's two different ways we'll be able to use React and I'll try to highlight both those, uh, those ways in today's lecture and likely uh, uh, the next lecture after as well. Okay, so at, at this point, we all should have a strong handle of JavaScript. We spent uh, months now, months now using JavaScript uh, and several, several labs. So uh, out of the 14 labs that we've done, I wanna say, uh, let's see, the first one was HTML, the second was CSS, the third was Bootstrap. So only three of them were not JavaScript. All the other labs were JavaScript oriented. And each time we implemented in JavaScript, we learned a little bit more. In fact, lab four itself was a very, that was the object oriented programming JavaScript lab. That was a platformer that hit you with JavaScript right over the head like it would be a Java lab. So at this, at this point, you should be well versed in uh, JavaScript syntax, especially as it comes to uh, being able to import uh, JavaScript modules into your source code. 
Okay, so we're going to learn a new way of developing a user interface in the browser, because that's what React allows us to do. It's going to be a uh, essentially a front end library, a front end um, uh, module that we can use to go ahead and uh, and more rapidly build out uh, our different views for our web applications. And so it's important to note that React has additional extensions. Uh, there's uh, React 360, for instance, that could be used for uh, VR uh, style applications. They have React Native uh, that allows you to build React-like applications and deploy onto mobile devices. Um, so React has really taken over the front end game, so to speak. So it's the most popular front end framework slash library that is used today. So it's definitely important that you know at least what React provides, what kind of functionality it provides, and how you might use it to design an application. So another important thing to know about React is it supports what we've been calling the single page app, SPA design pattern. And so just to ensure everyone understands what an SPA is, it's the idea that instead of breaking our website into a collection of web pages where you navigate between different HTML pages, the idea instead is that you only ever have the one HTML page, hence the term single page application. And the reason why we want to have just a single page is that recall that each individual HTML page inside of a browser maintains its own JavaScript runtime environment. So if you were to hop between multiple pages, you lose any data that is, uh, that is maintained or stored or executing or processing within that JavaScript runtime environment. And so since a JavaScript runtime environment in the browser provides the accessibility to the document object model to the things that are to the HTML that's actually being rendered in real time inside the browser, the in memory elements, uh, it is better for us to maintain the state of our JavaScript runtime environment and just mutate the state of our view via JavaScript. So this design pattern of maintaining a single page and mutating the view from that page is SPA. And this is where React really shines where it allows us to create these modular HTML-like components that we can tell React to render into our browser. Okay, so first of all, React is a library. Uh, React is a JavaScript library. It's used for building user interfaces. It allows us to build declarative components based on the current state of our application and it differs from the event-driven approach that we've used so far. Um, there's some other things that I'll talk about React, but I'll probably follow up uh, at the tail end of these lecture sequences to talk about some additional features that aren't necessarily exposed uh, um, uh, from the developer perspective in terms of implementing code, but things you should be aware of in terms of performance reasons why React is so nice, especially as it has what's called the virtual DOM. And again, we'll, we'll cover that later after we kind of cover some of the, the basics. Okay. So let's go back and in order to really see how re, what React gives to us, let's look back at what an event-driven app might look like. Uh, something we've already done multiple times now. So let's say, for instance, you have an array of strings that each represent a subject of a to-do list. Then the HTML code might be rendered as the following. You have like this unordered list where you have this ID for this list element called to-dos. And then inside of this unordered list, you might have each of the individual list items. So that might be like task one or task two, task three, right? This is simple enough to understand. So suppose uh, you want to add a new task on the click of a button. And again, when we talk about event-driven applications, what we're referencing is that the state of our application is changing with event listeners. So as we listen to the click of a button, right, we would set up some event listener that would respond to that and would likely add something to our list item. 
or if we want to delete something, we would have to do something similar, right? On a click of a button, or if you click a task, so we can even listen to these uh, list items if we wanted to. And if you were to click this, perhaps you could remove it by, uh, by clicking on it. So to add a new task, you would have to select that to do. The to do, was it? Yeah. To do's, okay. Keep that as it were. Okay, so you'd have to select the element with the ID to do's and then manipulate the HTML so that there is a new list item at the end of the list. And then to delete the task, you might have to find whatever the correct list item is that has to be deleted and remove it from the tree of list items from that uh, uh, unordered list in the DOM. So this is all doable and we've done things very similar to this before. In fact, some of you have even done things that are very like uh, to-do list like, uh, but there's some things to consider here. Uh, what happens if there are multiple uh, to-do lists in a single page? Or what happens if the user tries to add or delete a task at the same time? And so you can look for these considerations and for a smaller application like a to-do list, this isn't too problematic, but the idea is that these are uh, uh, having to constantly do this event-driven design becomes more and more complicated the larger your system becomes. It becomes less trivial to manage. And, uh, and, and, and one reason for that is because you have to take more and more precautions to ensure that all the individual components that you might be listening for don't interfere or conflict with one another. So React allows a different approach from what we've done before with that event-driven model. So React, again, it uses this declarative programming paradigm. And so instead of worrying about every action that could happen with your list, you first just define what your to-do list would look like given an array of strings. And then you can create a component using your above definition, that, that, that template containing the state uh, that contains all the titles of all the tasks. And then on click events, you modify the internal state and the component will update itself. And uh, again, if you want a visual concept of how this would kind of look uh, before I actually give you the hello world of this, think back to how we designed the quiz game where we were designing using string templates, essentially the, uh, the, the expression of the HTML for each state of our quiz game. And then we could add into it the contents of the question or the contents of the answers or, and, um, and similar to that. Okay, so at this point, your browser, so one thing we have to highlight when we, when we talk about React though, is that your browser does not or will not uh, understand um, uh, React code in its uh, most common form. It's not to say you can't create React. You can't. You, it's not to say you can't use the React library without having to uh, transpile it. However, React has a special syntax called JSX that allows you to essentially embed HTML-like code into your JavaScript. And this is one of the more powerful features of React. So we will definitely be using JSX. We will not omit the concept of JSX. But as soon as we start using JSX. It means that the uh, browser can't natively compile it because it's not true JavaScript. And so we'll have to use a solution that converts our JSX uh, code into true JavaScript code. And so there's lots of solutions that we will do for that. I will show you some of them uh, in today's lecture. So that is for one reason why I want to kick this can down uh, towards the end of the semester is because we typically will use a dev server to convert our JSX, our React JSS code into JavaScript code so it can execute inside the browser. And so we can use Node to do that. For us. We, could, uh, we could use a Node server that's just installed on our local machine to build our project. And effectively what, what we will use Node for, or outside of Node, we could also use other tools such as Babel or Webpack. But any one of these three will do the same thing. They will take our React code base and it bundles it and converts it into a single JavaScript file. And that, that, then that JavaScript file can be uh, 
interpreted and executed by the JavaScript runtime environment. Okay, and uh, additionally, uh, Node will also build our single HTML page and keep the dev server running to reload any changes. So this is common use of a dev server. So as you mutate the state of your JSX, it can uh, update your view automatically. And we'll get an example of this later on when we actually do local development uh, for the... Um... Okay, so for the demos that I like to do in class though, on uh, these lectures, I will not be using the, um, the about colon blank. I will not be using the local uh, JavaScript runtime environment that's embedded into the browser. I'm still, I'm gonna instead use an online uh, JavaScript runtime environment uh, that's used for sharing code. And I don't know if I've showed this before. Let me know if, I think maybe in the third day of lecture, I had mentioned this, but um, let's see here. Let me get to a new incognito men menu. Have I ever talked about codepin.io? This is a great resource that you could go to. I think when I went through browser tools, I highlighted this, but they have, you could search for lots of Sandbox experiments. Awesome, yeah, there's a lot of cool things you could see in terms of HTML, CSS, JavaScript code. It's uh, essentially a great little sandbox though where you can play around with front end development. And so I would recommend everyone go and create a, um, an account with CodePin. And this could be another portfolio piece. So if you create CodePin projects, that have little experimental code segments, like let's say animated buttons or sample portfolio pages or things like that, I recommend you also share this in your project section of your portfolio page. So just like you might share projects on GitHub, you can also share front end projects and experiments and demos in CodePin. So I'll be using CodePin for our demos here. I'm gonna show you how to set up a CodePin in case you want to run these examples yourself. And then I'm going to switch over to the one that I've pre-saved. So the, the way that you would do this is you would go and select the start coding section. And it should open up a new pin where you can embed HTML code here. Say, for instance, I can put in a paragraph and it could be like, hello. And then if I click out, it should render my hello. If I want to make that into a H1 instead. I can just do that. And now, okay, I have a heading one element. Perfect. Okay, so I can put HTML in there. I can put any Java, I mean, any CSS that I would need in here. I'm not going to worry about Siren right now, though. So let's uh, collapse this out some. And then I can put my JavaScript in here. Now, uh, for the purposes of what I'm going to be, uh, so I want to code in React, and I want to code in React that's going to use JSX. So I'll talk more about what JSX processing is, but notice Babel includes the JSX processing. This is one of the three technologies I had mentioned. So Babel is like a transpiler. So it can take things like TypeScript or things like JSX. So these are things, these are, these are, these are coding languages that are built off the concepts of JavaScript, but they could add things like static typing. They can add things like embedding HTML like syntax into your JavaScript and it converts it into just pure JavaScript. So we will go ahead and say, we need to use this JavaScript preprocessor of Babel. And then I'll actually have to import uh, my React and my React DOM uh, uh, modules, my libraries into here. And so uh, I don't actually remember what that is off the top. Let me close this for a moment and go back to my slides. So um, so let me actually go to mine as pre-save because I'm not gonna use this incognito window uh, board. Okay. There we go. Okay, so here, let me go back to here. So this is one that I pre-created uh, for today's lecture called uh, React Preview. And so if I go to my settings, for JavaScript, you'll see I have the Babel JavaScript preprocessor, and then I have the uh, necessary scripts that are hosted online, but you could, just like we've done previously, like with Bootstrap, you could always download these and offer these locally if you wanted to just go ahead and service them from somewhere else. But these are 
these 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 are uh, very strong uh, uh, and available uh, links, so you should not be worried about just cross-linking them if you wanted to. So, but I'll just go ahead and um, grab the React development.js file and the React DOM uh, development JS file for being able to do today's testing. And so this would be the equivalent in your code as importing React and React DOM into your source code. So I'm just illustrating that when I do my demos, I am importing them, but I'm doing it through this uh, user interface that code can provide. Okay, so let me close out of this and go back to my slides. Okay. So I just show how to set that up on my own slides. Am I lagging for anybody else? My system feels super laggy. <laughs> Yes, no, uh, uh, can you still hear me? Where am I disconnected? Okay, perfect. So let's go back over here. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the hello world example for our React code. So here, Imagine if I have my index.html. Uh, it is, as you can see, just a common HTML, uh, HTML um, notation. So HTML has got a head, nothing in the head. Uh, it has the body, and inside the body, I just have this div tag. I mean, this div element, which has the ID attribute of root. And so here, actually, let me see if it will let me copy that. Oh, come on, I'm not going to be able to do demos if it does not let me copy. Hang on just a moment. Let us kill this process. Okay. Let's see here. Can I access here? Can I go switch in here? Okay, seems more responsive to me. I don't know what it's been about, but um, Zoom recording, the Zoom camera has been causing significant lag inside my browser. Okay, so now I can go ahead and start copying things again. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Excellent, okay, so I'm still connected, I'm still recording, but now I have much less lag. I just had to kill all the processing that was happening on the GPU, uh, the uh, Chrome tab, likely because of uh, the video feed through, um, through Zoom. Okay, so let's grab this source code. This is pretty simple source code. I'm gonna just throw this right into the HTML portion here, right? And so obviously it's gonna render nothing because we don't have any content in here. We just have one div tag that's called root. And that's gonna be essentially the entry point of our React app. So now let's look at the other part. Let's look at the actual JavaScript part. And so here for the JavaScript part, we are going to import the React module from react okay so if i were to go ahead and um download react.js and react-dom.js from those uh hyperlinks i showed you i could import them as modules into my source code for my browser side now again this won't actually run on browser side that's why i'm not doing it about colon blank because i'm using jsx i'll show you where the jss at JSX says in just a moment, but right here, all I'm doing is importing my libraries. So I need two libraries, React, which will allow me to define a React-like component and allow me to, uh, and then React DOM will allow me to render my React components. So that's the two different steps that React provides to me. So I need two imports, two 
modules for that. There are two libraries. Then this is the actual JSX. So here I'm going to create a constant variable that's called JSX underscore element. And I'm going to save into it what looks like HTML, right? So I can now create HTML syntax right in JavaScript. Now notice this is not what we were doing in the quiz lab where I was using the string templates, right? Notice this is not a string, right? It's very similar to what we were doing, but this is, does not have double quotations. It does not have single quotations, apostrophes. It does not have the ticks. So, so up to this point, without React, we can do something that's very React-like, but we have to use string templates. What GSX allows us to do is that same concept without the string templates. And so this is why we can't just run this in the browser. If I tried to run this in the browser, uh, it will fail at this. It'll say, what is happening here? And so this is the part that has to get converted into true JavaScript through Babel or through Node or through Webpack. It transpiles this code into something that is JavaScript congruent. Anyway, so we go ahead and we save our, our essentially our HTML into this JSX element. And then from the document, we're going to get an element by ID. We're going to get that div that has the ID of root. And we're going to say, OK, that's our DOM element. And then what we do inside of our React DOM call, so inside of React DOM, this is one of the modules we import it. Uh, we, it has a render method where we can pass in the elements, the JSX elements that need to get rendered, and where they get rendered to inside the HTML. So the, the, the entry point into the HTML that we're going to go ahead and replace uh, with our JSX. Excellent. So actually, let me grab this too. So I grab the HTML. Let me grab this. And again, I don't need these imports. These imports are done for me inside of um, CodePen via that uh, the settings. So all I need to do is to go ahead and also let me stretch this out. I'm not going to use any styling. So here, so let's see if I can't get a hello world to render in here. And there it is. So notice hello world goes ahead and renders using React. And all I'm doing is I'm creating some simple JSX, binding it to this variable. I am grabbing a uh, reference to this div tag here to root here and saving that into here. And then when I call my render function, I pass the JSX as the first parameter and where it's going to get added into my HTML page into the second. It's just that simple. That simple to use React effectively. Now we're gonna learn a lot more about how we can use React in more effective ways. This simple hello world example. Excellent. Is there any questions in terms of what's happening just with this code up to this point? Or is this making sense uh, uh, in terms of the demo? Okay, excellent. So let me... Okay, so already explained this. I'm not going to go through slides after I... Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the JSX. So JSX stands for JavaScript XML. And so I know we've talked about HTML, and I'm pretty sure that I defined HTML as being hypertext markup language. And at this point, we should be aware that hypertext is a form of hypermedia, which is defined by the HTTP protocol as the type of data that can be exchanged between clients and servers. So now, and hypermedia is defined by the MIME types. And so that could be things like PNGs or JPEGs or MP3s or MP4s or HTML pages or, uh, or JSON slash application or right, um, uh, data. So it allows us to uh, define essentially the data types that get transmitted between servers and clients. So did I ever mention then how HTML is a subset of XML? And so XML stands for extensible markup language. And so XML just means that 
And extensible markup language means it uses markup. So we learned what markup is. Markup is this concept that you can create uh, uh, meta information or metadata about content by encapsulating it between open and closed tags. So again, we can define a part of our content in HTML as being a heading one element or a heading two element or as a paragraph element or a list item or a list element, right? So these are all um, uh, ways that we mark up the content so that the browser knows how to render it. So XML is a general purpose concept of just using markup. So there are more use cases of markup than just creating HTML pages. And so that is what XML is. And so if you've ever used like a build tool, many build tools, uh, for instance, uh, use XML files to configure or, or to set the configuration settings on it. In fact, the two most prominent um, um, uh, formats of configuration files are either JSON or XML. So, if you, so it's just a way of ascribing a relationship of the contents of a document and how they should be interpreted. Anyway, so enough about that. That just illustrates that this is a JavaScript, essentially XML. So JSX is an extension to JavaScript that enables you to write that HTML-like syntax directly into your JavaScript. This enables the ability to start writing HTML templates inside of your JavaScript code. So this is not dissimilar to what we were kind of doing in the authentication lab with EJS. And then you can also embed expressions, variables, and properties directly into JSX. Okay, so let's look at an alternate example of using properties inside of uh, JSX. So here, in this instance, inside of that index.js uh, file, I'm going to create an object and I'm going to call it user. This object is gonna have two properties. The first property will be called first name. The, la the second property will be called last name. And so the first name will be Harper. The last name will be Perez. Then we'll create a function that's called format name. It will take in a user object and it will create a string template that contains the first name, space, and then the last name. And of course, we should all be familiar with these string templates, how I can go ahead and use the dollar sign and curly braces to access or embed JavaScript into a string to do reference data or do a for loop or if statement or, or uh, method invocation or, or function invocation or anything like that. Okay, so then this will be my JSX element. So I'm gonna create an L, oh, I'm going to create an element. Now, if I want to create, um, I think I've covered this before too. If I want to create something that is multi-lined, but it's supposed to be uh, represented as a single line uh, statement, I can go ahead and encapsulate it inside of uh, parentheses, right? So this parentheses just allows me to start creating more complex JSX um, um, syntax, J JSX uh, statements or lines or declarations, that's a better word is declarations, a, a larger JSX declaration that spans multiple lines. And so it will grab all of what is stated between the opening paragraph uh, parentheses and the, um, the closing parentheses here. So here I'm gonna create a heading one element inside the heading, uh, heading one element, I will say hello. And then just like I can dereference things inside of a string template, I can actually dereference or access normal JavaScript inside of curly braces. The one uh, difference is that I don't need to use the dollar sign. I just I embed it inside of curly brackets. So inside the curly brackets, I can now go ahead and uh, make a normal JavaScript call inside of this HTML, essentially, what looks like HTML inside my JSX. I'm going to invoke this format name function. I'm gonna pass it in this object. 
So this is going to then dereference. And so keep in mind that what's happening when I go ahead and make this invocation is it's going to return back this string template. It's going to be the first name and the last name. And then I will tell that React DOM module, that, that, that object essentially that I import, to invoke its render function. And I'm going to pass it in this element, this JSX element, as the first parameter. And then as the second parameter, I'm just going to pass it in uh, what gets returned from the DOM's invocation to get an element by ID of root. So that's again, instead of binding it to a variable and passing the variable, I'll just go ahead and do the invocation to the DOM here and the resulting call of this invocation will be my second parameter. But effectively that's my DOM element, right? The div that has the root ID. So again, just two parameters for the render method. The first is the JSX and the second is gonna be the, um, the access to my div to my HTML. And actually, let's hop on over here and replace this code. And did I do the import? No, perfect. And so here, you can see I go ahead and, in fact, do render hello Harper Perez. So this is just an example of how I can go ahead and actually embed JavaScript into my JSX very similar to the way we would do it in a string template. Okay, uh, so is there any questions about this particular example? I can, I guess, just go through them. So note that the index.html has not changed, right? We use the same index.html. To use React for our entire app, you can use that single div in the body as the React's entry point. And so the rest of our code is going to be JavaScript code. And again, we've already used this philosophy before to build our quiz game. So effectively, React is a library that does all the overhead management of rendering HTML components into an HTML page so that you don't have to write much HTML, so that you do it all as JavaScript in a very object-oriented way. So React provides us an object-oriented or functional uh, a uh, uh, concept, a uh, paradigm of starting to design our user interfaces. And we'll actually learn how to use React in both an OOP way and a functional design way. This first approach will be using it in a functional approach, which is the same way that we use it inside of, or the same way we design our quiz game without React. Okay, so anyway, we defined a function called format name that takes an object, yep, uh, that has the two properties, first and last name, and then the format name return that single string of both those elements, and then we use that function format name inside of our JSX code, and then we had uh, the um, uh, React DOM go ahead and render that into our HTML. Okay, so why might we want to use JSX as opposed to um, the string templates that we're doing. Well, first of all, why don't we talk about why you, you want to use either of those. So JSX, first of all, allows us to separate our content from our presentation, right? So they, we, we've talked about that before. Um, the reason why we don't embed all of our style into our HTML pages is that the HTML should just be for your content, whereas the presentation of the data, the CSS, should be in its own styling sheets. And so that's one of the core uh, separation of responsibilities in, in web development. However, web applications, we typically define a lot of our HTML now in JavaScript. And that gives us the ability to change the HTML that's rendered on the page because we're starting to use these SPA design patterns for building web applications. So instead of oscillating between multiple sites, we always maintain the one site and we produce whatever the current HTML contents is we do that dynamically client side via JavaScript. And so that means our HTML code can pause, can change throughout our JavaScript code base. And so JSX just gives us the ability to write out templated HTML code in a very intuitive fashion. And again, we wanna use JSX over string templates because we have to define all of the logic that governs string templates, whereas JSX, all of these concerns are handled through the React library. 
So it's the same reason why we don't want to build web servers from scratch every time we build a web application using Node. The reason why we use Express is because it handles all the concerns of web servers for us. And so that's the real value that React will provide to you. Okay, so let's take another look at an example. Let's go ahead and update our index.js page. And so for in this instance, we will go ahead and uh, import React. We'll go ahead and import the React DOM. And here, let's create a function that's called tick. And this tick function will create a J, uh, JSX element. So here, we're gonna bind it to this uh, variable here called element. And inside of here, again, since this is a multi-line JSX declaration, we'll go ahead and open up our parentheses here and close them here so we can have more than one line. So one thing about um, your JSX syntax is that it has to have a root element. Uh, and what I mean by that is, notice my root element is just a div tag here. So suppose I wanted to have these two elements. That's really what I want is to have two elements uh, HTML uh, elements, one that is a heading one tag, hello world. The other is a heading two tag that's going to show me what the current time is. Now, I couldn't just return these without encapsulating them in a div first because it's not a singular node. So the idea behind uh, what these React JSX elements represent is a singular element. So if there's more than one HTML element that you want to return, then you have to nest them into a parent div. And that parent div can always be that single HTML node, that single JSX node that will be returned to embed into uh, whatever you're rendering in on your HTML side. For us, it's that root div, if you might recall. So in this instance, I will have a div. This div will then contain my heading one, which says hello world, and a heading two. The heading two will do a dereference to be able to access with curly braces to access uh, any JavaScript that I might want to embed. In this instance, I want to access from the standard library in the browser, the date object, the date class. I will instantiate a new date and I will invoke from it the to local uh, uh, time string. And I will display that as a heading two element. Then after I do that, I'm going to use the React DOM object to render this JSX and I will render that JSX in that root div. Then I will use my JavaScript to just set an interval, right? This is a scheduled event, a timed event, to go ahead and invoke tick every 1,000 milliseconds. So let's see what happens when we go ahead and copy this code. Uh, okay. Delete. And this is slightly frustrating. It's <laughs> my, uh, yeah, I shouldn't be lagging that bad. Okay. Let me just hit backspace. Kills my demos when I can't interact with my uh yeah. okay. I'm just going. We will do what I did last time because this is Okay, well, let's try doing a refresh. What is going on here? Okay, let me. 
can do this. Well, let me just, yes, reload this site. What I can do if necessary is, well, maybe we can just say, you can imagine what this, uh, what this source code does. So at this point, I'm having such difficulty with lag on my system. No, it's, uh, the problem is that I don't see much of my CPU usage. Okay, let's. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah, the problem is uh, appears that uh, yeah, the problem appears that um, Zoom video takes up 138 percent of my processing cycles, and it puts me in a devastating amount of lag to do anything else. So every so often, I have to kill the process to be able to eat recollect some of these clock cycles so I can refresh a browser window. Okay, so everyone can hear me though. Okay, so now let's see here. Let's see if we can't get this to uh, let's go ahead and run. So, oh, I need to remove my imports. Hop over here. Oh, Lord. And of course, as soon as Zoom comes back, I'm in. Okay, so I just don't think I'll be able to demo this out. It's not worth fighting, trying to demo things and record my Zoom lectures at the same time. Yeah. They're, they're. So you will have to you will have to trust that you can run these demos on your own, and uh, we will not do any more demos with with, with React that's live because it's just too frustrating. <laughs> But uh, okay, so what is going to happen here is the uh, tick function will get invoked every uh, 1,000 milliseconds, which is every second, which means that the contents of my HTML will update what is displayed in the time each you know, for for each moment. And so I advocate that you test this on your own. Okay. Oh, uh, no, that's not. Okay, well, okay, so let's move on. I can't even move to the next slide. Come on, let me get to... <laughs> okay, one last. Let's see where our cycles are now.
Hopefully that's the last time I have to do that. I am not going to run my video feed to see if this improves my lag experience for the remainder of the class. Maybe sending both a uh, my screen and my camera might be causing some issues. Okay. So can everyone see my screen though? Am I, is my screen shared? No. Okay. Share the screen. Okay, there we go. And so here we will, we will give up on trying to do this. And we will just trust that these, uh, these work though. But you can see this isn't doing anything special. All it's doing though is it's, in call, it's invoking this function and it's gonna cause the React DOM to re-render re the contents of the JSX each time this function gets recalled. So every 1000 seconds. Okay, well, everyone can see my screen now though, right? Before I move on to the, uh, off of the source code, perfect. Okay, so every call to React DOM .render tells React to re-render the elements given the data that it currently has. So the code set interval is obviously a timed function. We've covered it before. It's going to uh, invoke the tick function every 1000 milliseconds or every second. Uh, the tick function defines the GSX uh, code, the element, and, and causes the re-render to occur. Okay. So let's talk about components. So this is one of the things that I like most about React, uh, one of the, the more powerful concepts of React on being able to start breaking our uh, user interface down into reusable components. So you can think of a component in terms of a user interface principle as what an object would be in a uh, software design uh, application. And so the focus on components are as independent reusable pieces that can be placed anywhere. So say for instance, suppose you were designing a web, your, your web view out and you had a nav bar. You might have like a nav bar component or you might have like a, a banner component or you might have a list component that allows you to put list items in there. So these things that you reuse a lot that you might have to populate with data uh, to, to display, you can define as these JSX components. And so the uses of the uh, composability relationship is that each element can comp be composed of other elements. So you have the same, so that's a similar principle that we use inside of object oriented uh, principles as well, right? It's where you can have a compound objects that are built from other constituent objects. So we can create complex components that themselves contain uh, simpler uh, JSX components. So again, we can start to yield all that training and all of the power that we've learned that object-oriented principles provides to us and start designing our user interfaces uh, with that in mind using React. So components, using a combination of JSX and JavaScript, you can bundle a look and feel and functionality into a single JavaScript class. You can consider these React elements and HTML elements that can uh, be placed wherever you like and um, the anatomy of what we call the uh, components is as follow. So here's a quick component example. And uh, so, so I would normally do my similar imports that I would do here. I would import my React object and my React DOM object into my local scope. Let's create a function here. Let's call this function format name. And so here for our, it is common for our components to be defined similar to the way you have classes. So notice this is not a mistake of typing and you probably saw this in the quiz lab as well. Our function components that produce, or our functions that compose, that produce React components start with a capital or uppercase letter. And it's because we can, we can declare React components to either be functions that return JSX, or we can declare them to be classes that return uh, JSX. So in React, we can, we can define these components as either functions or classes. We will learn the syntax of both um, over the course of these lectures. We will start by using the function-like 
declarations. But either way, we use the same uh, notation principles of using uppercase letter for our uh, components. So here, this component will be uh, the format name. It could take in a collection of properties. So whenever we want to pass data into a component, a React component, we usually only have one um, um, uh, parameter, and the parameter is an object. It's a properties uh, object that contain whatever collection of parameters you would want to uh, access from, from those properties. And so inside of this function, we will go ahead and return. And we're going to return our JSX, so just like we did in the previous example. So we'll encapsulate our JSX between these parentheses. And so here we're going to do a heading one element. And we will say hello. And then we will dereference prop from our props the first name. And then from our props, the last name property. So this is coming from the object that's getting passed into format name. So let's see, how can we invoke this format name inside of our JSX, inside of re our React code? Well, when we go to invoke React DOM to do its render, our first parameter can actually also contain JSX. Now, remember, I said JSX stands for JavaScript Extensible Markup Language. Extensible markup language means that you can extend the markup um, uh, uh, tags, the markup elements that exist. That's what it means to be extensible, right? You don't have a set number of things. You can add on to it. You can extend it. So in this instance, by creating this function format name, it allows us now to actually have, as if it were an HTML element, a new element that doesn't exist or did not exist before. And this is the true power of React. So now I can tell it to render a JSX component that is of type format name. And so this allows us as developers to create effectively what looks like new HTML elements of any name specific to our application. And this is why React is a more powerful approach of building our, group, our user interfaces than what we did previously without React by just using string templates. Because string templates, we are still only restricted to having a predefined set of HTML. We're restricted to the HTML elements. But now we can start defining our own element names based off of our application. And then if I want to pass data into this this uh, uh, JSX element, I would define it like attributes just as if it were a uh, HTML element. So I would pass in a property of first name and then give it the value of Ted, the property last name and give it the value of Homebird. And then when this gets invoked, effectively what's happening here is it's invoking this function format name and it's passing first name and last name into the properties object of it so that I can then access anything, any attribute that has first name and last name from that properties. And if I want to add a third thing, like if I want to add, um, let's say, uh, uh, middle name, I could do it just like this. And then all of a sudden I could do and update my function like this. This is the powerful thing about having things embedded in properties is that it, I don't have to define the, redefine the parameters list, which is always a big no-no uh, in uh, software development. Uh, when you create a function, you never want to update the parameter list. So having a parameter list set as just a properties allows us to dynamically add a new property into the invocation, and then I can dereference it just like that. Excellent. Is there any questions to this? Does everyone see here? the possibility with these React components or to see how these React components allow us to create our own kind of developer-defined, essentially, HTML tags for elements. They're really JSX elements, but they're very HTML-like. And again, you can run this the same way I ran the previous code, but I'm not going to try it. I'm tempted to try it. Very tempted. I spent all this time getting this. I hope maybe if my camera's not uh, on, 
it'll be easier to try this. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah. So now, now I think the issue was having my camera and the screw share on at the same time while also trying to run React example code. So here we could see, yes, that does indeed work exactly as I described it to. Okay, so here we are creating a component by creating a function. The name of the function is called format name, is now the name of the element, the JSX element. The React library takes that function and creates a component out of it that can then be used in JSX syntax. And then we could define properties that can be dereferenced in there the same way we would define attributes in our HTML. And so props, it's a parameter called props. It's passed into this function. Props is an object that contains all the attributes and values that are passed into the element. So uh, component instance property. So when you add the attribute, let's say first name, um, yeah. So if we add the first name, Ted, this uh, props object will have a key name of uh, first name and have the value of Ted. These properties are immutable once they're passed in. And then with the return, when the function returns, is uh, that is effectively our HTML that's generated by the component. This function is executed and the HTML is generated in a number of areas in React. And so this function returns JS X code that the component would then render into. Now, one cool thing about this is that we can start nesting these into one another. So if I wanted to, I could create another function that's called, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, pet name, I don't know. And then make it a return thing. So here I'll just, uh, let's spell this out. So I could do function, let's say pet name, and let's say this takes properties. And then let's just say uh, return. And let's say that this just returns h1, h1. And let's say that this uh, this was Peter. And if I wanted to, I can go ahead and, or actually, let me just do what I was doing before. Let's do props dot uh, name. I can use composition. So inside of this component, I can actually call this uh, other component that then passes in uh, name equals Peter. Perfect. And so here you could start to see how the same ability to start breaking up these really complex user interfaces. You probably noticed your user interfaces can get really, really complex in terms of nesting elements. Like you might have a div that nests into another div that nests into another div that has a heading element that then has a list item. Uh, I mean, uh, a list element and that list element might have multiple list items, right? Uh, and that might just be your nav bar. And then you have another div after that and maybe some rows and columns. And yeah, uh, your HTML can get very crowded and complex looking and very hard to parse. And so one of the things we can start doing here is breaking this up and giving the elements themselves more readable names. So actually I can create this format name component that itself uses another component to make it more readable. Okay, let me remove that because that's not supposed to be part of that. Okay, perfect. Okay. And so at least for my introduction into React, uh, that is that, that that that's my initial introduction into it, and then we're, we'll take a deeper look into uh, what are called React hooks, which allows us to start being able to share state between our components. So one of the big things about our components is that they are uh, supposed to be effectively immutable. So you don't want to you want to try to reserve from having to uh, have. Uh, dependent state that's shared across multiple components. And so there are hooks that allow us to hook into uh, where your data application state is at so that you can access it to be able to display data. And that's what we will talk about next time in, uh, in our next lecture 
is React hooks. And then after React hooks, and we see how to do that, we'll see how to define React components the same way we've been doing in terms of functions, but instead using a more class-based approach where we can define a class that uh, inherits from a React component and can define things like its own initial state in case you do need to have React components that maintain uh, their own internal state and then have a render function, which automatically gets called when it's in the form of an object. Okay, with that said, is there any questions about what we covered today? Is, uh, is React effectively making, oh yeah, so React is a very powerful tool. React, there's a reason why React has become the uh, number one uh, front end framework slash library that is used in industry it's, uh, today is because it leverages the power of functional programming paradigms and object-oriented programming paradigms in constructing complex user interfaces. And this becomes almost necessarily a uh, tool that you will use when building web applications that take the design pattern of a single page app, of uh, SPA. Since you're having to dynamically generate uh, your user interface uh, your, the, for each changing state of your view, uh, then this allows you to do it in a very object-like way. So yes, this is definitely a technology that's worth learning about, that's worth using, but definitely worth talking about, since if you're going to claim to be a full-stack uh, developer after this class, you should at least know what's happening with the React language. And of course, I would, I would encourage you all to at least try out now i will offer a lab that'll give you the hands-on practice but try considering using react um uh for your full stack application or at least a personal project as well but uh you will get some hands-on practice with it uh, with a lab that i'll be uh, signing probably on monday and that'll be due at the very tail end of uh the semester it'll be the last lab that we go ahead and uh do so probably like may 12 or whatnot is when I'll make the React Lab. And it'll be simple. It'll be small and simple, similar to the uh, probably Lab 14. And what I'm really thinking about is just having you rebuild the quiz game, but using React as opposed to your JavaScript so that you could compare and contrast the two. And I actually designed the quiz game to be a readapted into a React project uh, purposely so you could see how to do it in pure JavaScript and then how, and how to do it using uh, the React framework or library. Excellent. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, then I will um, I will stop recording this lecture here so it doesn't get too lengthy. I'm sorry that we had so many lag issues earlier that kind of compromised our ability to do some demos, but you should be able to take the slides. I'm gonna post the slides as soon as uh, I'm done with this lecture and you'll have access to them. And uh, everyone, good luck uh, on your, uh, your labs. Have a great weekend, and I will see all of you next Tuesday.